Good evening, and welcome to this webinar sponsored by the WM Keck Institute for Space Studies at Caltech. Uh, I'm Tom Prince, I'm director of the Keck Institute. For those of you who are not familiar with us, uh, you might ask what is the Keck Institute for Space Studies? Well, in short, we are a think tank for new ideas about the future of space exploration. We carry out our work jointly with the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we endeavor to bring the best scientists and engineers from the US and around the world to participate in our studies. And our studies cover a full range of topics, solar system exploration, astronomy, Earth observations, and space engineering. We are very grateful to the WM Keck Foundation for their founding funding of the Keck Institute and we are very grateful to the Caltech Space Innovation Council for their generous current support of our institute. So turning a bit to uh, the webinar and tonight's program, before 2020, all of our trucks were presented in person in a lecture hall on the Caltech campus, attended by perhaps 100 uh, uh, people or so. Then came the pandemic. Because of the pandemic, if we wanted to continue uh, having uh, lectures, we had to change our format to allow remote attendance. And the response has been very gratifying to that. A typical Keck Institute webinar is open to the public now and is now seen by several hundred people uh, uh, for each individual webinar. And I already see that we have several hundred uh, uh, viewing the webinar uh, this evening. For those of you who have attended our webinars in the past, you will know that Caltech students and postdocs play an important role in our webinars. For instance, I will not be introducing the speaker this evening. Rather, that will be done by one of the Keck Institute affiliates a group of uh, Caltech graduate students and postdocs who are passionate about space studies and space exploration. I will, however, mention one item about our speaker this evening, and that is Charles Olachi played an absolutely critical role in the founding of the uh, Keck Institute. Without his support and advocacy, the Keck Institute may not have ever happened. We thank Charles Alachi for his many contributions over the years to the Keck Institute, and we are very, very glad to finally have him here as a speaker this evening. So now I'd like to call on one of the heads of the affiliates group, Michael Connell. He's a graduate uh, a student in aerospace engineering. Since this is an affiliates event, Mike will be introducing the speaker and directing the correct question and answer period afterwards. So uh, Mike will be your host uh, for the rest of this evening. Thanks for joining the Keck Institute affiliates for this talk and enjoy the rest of the evening. Mike, over to you. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to have you with us uh, for another installment of the KISS lecture series. Uh, today is a real treat. We have Dr. Charles Alachi with us to discuss the transformation of Earth observation through spaceborne radars. Dr. Charles Alachi is a Caltech alum here in both his MS and PhD in electrical sciences here. He is also, uh, he also has earned his uh, BS in physics from the University of Grenoble, uh, an engineering diploma from the Polytechnic Institute of, in Grenoble, uh, an MBA from USC and an MS in geology uh, from UCLA. Um, Dr. Charles Alachi was the director of JPL for 16 years uh, and he's really had an incredible career uh, with uh, incredible profound influence on space and space exploration. Um, in addition to uh, the spaceborne radars that we'll be hearing about tonight, uh, Dr. Charles Lachi, uh, he's taught physics, he taught the physics of remote sensing at Caltech for 18 years. Um, he's led research and development of many, many uh, spaceflight instruments and missions. Um, and he's been elected to the National Academy of Engineering and the the list of honors goes on and on and on um some things that i think are, are really fun about his career he's even participated in uh archaeological expeditions to the egyptian desert uh the arabian arabian peninsula and the western china desert uh searching for old trading routes and buried cities using satellite data um somewhere high above us is the asteroid 4116 halachi 
uh, and JPL's Mission Control Center has even been named for him. Uh, so if you would like a longer list of his accomplishments, um, I'm going to usher you to Wikipedia. Uh, otherwise, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Charles Zalachi. Well, thank you, Mike, and uh, for this introduction. And also, I want to thank uh, Tom and uh, Michelle for inviting me to give this talk, you know, today. Uh, 40 years ago, this next week, uh, the first scientific experiment on the space shuttle took place. And that experiment, which after was called SIR A for shuttle imaging radar A, really reshaped how, and basically put the foundation of how uh, we observe the earth using microwave radar. And it built on the legacy of that mission, which built uh, all a series of mission, which led to uh, a dozen of space imaging radars today. And it was done by a bunch of young people all in their 20s and 30s. They are researchers from JPL and Caltech. And what I'm going to do today is kind of tell you a little bit about the history of it, how it evolved and how it led to do today's capability in Earth observation you know, with radar. And I will include a little bit of technical detail considering that uh, this is a Caltech talk. So for the Caltech people, I mean, I'm sure they want to have uh, you know, some technical detail about it. So if we go to the 1970s, in the middle of the 1970s, uh, a big deal was the shuttle. Uh, NASA was putting major effort in building it. And the plan was to actually fly the first four shuttle flights basically completely empty uh, because they wanted to test the propulsion and uh, the habitat and all the system of the shuttle. And then somebody came up with a great idea and said, well, why sending it only empty? Why don't we put some high risk, high payoff scientific experiments on that mission and basically demonstrate some of that capability of the shuttle in Earth observation? So they made an announcement of opportunity uh, for uh, anybody to, to propose on it. And so myself, I was heading a group at JPL. I said, well, why don't we propose? And there was some leftover hardware that we knew would be left over from CSAT. So in 1976, we submitted a proposal, not having any idea how successful that's going to be. And guess what? We were selected. So here a bunch of young people, we were in charge of the first scientific experiment to be thrown on the space shuttle with all the public attention to it. And as you can see on your right, uh, that's not the first one. This is a later one, but it gives you an idea. It's very similar to the SIR A, which was the first uh, first experiment, and it basically filled the whole shuttle, you know, on it. So, so to tell you a little bit, this is a team which started doing it. So it was a good uh, uh, combination of uh, young people. Uh, I'm not going to tell you which one I am. Uh, many of you will guess I'm the one with the mustache, you know, in the middle there was a model of the Sir A, and here are people all, or literally all in their 20s, a majority of them, except for two or three you know, like Walter Brown on the right and, uh, uh, and Ed Caro on the left. Uh, so these were the people who had some experience. Now we, the younger one, we had no idea what's impossible. So when a door opened for us, we just walked through it. And the more experienced guys kind of gave us some, some advice about, uh, about uh, you know, what to avoid and uh, what mistake not to make. So, and this shows one of our meetings, you know, the people who were planning, uh, some of you who are on, uh, watching this might recognize Joby, Vicky, Sue, Annie, uh, Mike uh, Daly, and uh, Mike Kobrick. And many of these people were Caltech graduates. Uh, matter of fact, uh, just yesterday, I got an email from Carol Casey, who had, was the Associate Director for Student uh, Faculty Affairs, telling me that her brother, uh, Darren, who is a Caltech graduate, also worked on some of these shuttle experiments. So there were many people from Caltech who participated in it. So, and this is was after we launched, that was our first waiting for the first signal to come from Surrey. Now, remember in those days, we didn't have the fancy digital recorders we have now. Uh, it was all put on an optical film. So we couldn't tell if actually data was being recorded, uh, but we could tell that signal has been transmitted and echo has been received. So that was our indication. Also, the, you know, that, uh, that the system was working. 
And I remember, uh, you know, 40 years ago, as soon as the shuttle landed, and in the early days, it used to land in the Mojave Desert, we had somebody go sneak in, I mean, it was approval, uh, and pulled out the cassette of the optical film, drove it in the middle of the night to JPL, developed it, so we see, do we have a signal? And fortunately, we had a signal, and more fortunate, uh, we, it was a great success, because about a month before the launch, uh, I got called into the director's office at JPL. It was Bruce Murray at that time. And he said, uh, Charles, I just got the call from the administrator of NASA and he's really anxious for this mission to be successful because everybody on the hill is asking, what is the use of the shuttle? And this is the first demonstration of its use. So there was a little bit of, of pressure on this young engineer and young scientist working at JPL. Fortunately, it all worked out. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of the data from it. This is an image we've taken with the imaging radar over China. Now I should have mentioned a unique feature about radars is we generate our own signal. So we don't rely on the sun to illuminate the surface for us like you do with cameras and optical system. So we generate our own signal so we can operate day and night. In addition, microwave, which the radar uses uh, you know, for its signal, actually penetrates through clouds, through rain, so we can get data all the time. Uh, similar to your radio, when you are listening to ra your radio, it doesn't matter if it's cloudy or not, you still get the music you are looking for. So here, so it's an all time, all weather kind of system, which allow us to image the surface exactly like a camera. Now here, the color are somewhat false color because we kind of added the color to make it a little bit more dramatic. And this is a picture that we took over Egypt. So this is, uh, you can see the pyramids. You see a little, you know, in the, in the square at to the top, you see that. So that was the early kind of resolution that, that we were getting. And this is taken over uh, New Guinea. And this picture was so dramatic or maybe colorful that it made the front cover of national, uh, sorry, of Scientific American. But the most dramatic one was this picture. So when we were taking images over Northern Africa and the Sahara, I mean, we expected to see sand dunes because when you look at the Landsat image on your left, all what you see is sand dunes. But then when we looked at the radar image, we could see all kinds of drainage channels. So we were first taken aback uh, that what, what are these that we are seeing? But then quickly being a Caltech you know, uh, graduate and people from Caltech said, you know, maybe we are penetrating through that sand because we are using microwave and on microwave, if you are in a tunnel with your radio, you still can, can hear it. So, and that actually what happened, we should have thought about it earlier, is that actually we were imaging the drainage channels below the sand. And these were drainage channels which existed a few thousand years ago when North Africa was much more humid than it is now. And then there was a change in the climate and then sand dunes basically covered all these old drainage channels. So we did uh, appropriate calculation and so on, and it sure all worked out. So that's how uh, you see it again, the same, uh, the same area. And here we were using what we call L-bands. So uh, that's for the radar guys, but for the general public, we use wavelengths of about 24 centimeter or frequency of about 1.2 you know, gigahertz. And we can penetrate typically a couple of dozen of wavelengths so we could penetrate many meters below the surface. But being a scientist, we wanted to make sure that really actually there are drainage channels in that area. So we actually went and did a field trip. And here you see me in, uh, in the Western desert of Egypt. And here I thought I'll tell you a little story. Now, getting in the Western desert of Egypt, you don't go to the neighborhood Earths in Cairo and rent a car and drive. This was like 300 miles away from any inhabitation. So actually working with geologic survey in the US and the geologic survey in Egypt, there was a whole group of us with a lot of workers which went with us ahead of time, laid out the tents for us. It was pretty luxurious. You know, actually they were making our bets every day, you know, the Egyptian workers. And then we had to bring all our food with us uh, and water. So it turned out that the best way to get food is to take live ducks because supposedly live ducks you know, survive very well in the heat. So that's what was transported with us. And all the ducks were in the cook's tent. So one day we were asking the cook, well, how could you sleep? These ducks are so noisy. He said, oh, no problem. 
whatever ducks is the noisiest, that's what you get the, for dinner that night. And he said the ducks after a while, they get awfully quiet on doing that. So we had a lot of ducks. We were there for like about four weeks. So we had lots of ducks during that period, but it was a great adventure. And we actually did some digging, you know, in the area where we saw those channels and we could see pebbles, you know, which are basically rounded pebbles, which mean they were done or they were, uh, uh, you know, they, they were under, you know, water flow or fluvial flow, which rounded them. We saw the edge of these drainage channels, the center of them, and we could see that these drainage channels were about a few meters you know, below the surface. And the reason it was interesting for, and, and of course this made National Geographic, Science Magazine, every magazine in the world actually had that picture on it and talking about this discovery, which got archeologists very excited about it because for them, they thought that if we can lay out all these drainage channels in North Africa, that's probably where all the trade routes were there because the trade routes most likely were around uh, rivers and matter of fact we did see we did get artifacts you know from uh, from about seven eight thousand years ago which we found as we were digging uh, in that area it's not cities but these were trading trading routes now as a result of this when we were uh, and, and again to tell you a little bit uh, for particularly for the young researchers now who struggle in getting funding from NASA so after all that experiment was done, uh, I was briefing the administrator of NASA. I think his name was Jim Bex at that time. So at the end of the presentation, he said, this is fantastic. Do you have any new ideas? I thought, oh, sure. We can take that antenna and put it on a moving platform and do you know, uh, multiple angle imaging. He said, why don't you send me a proposal and don't make it longer than 10 pages? So two weeks later, we sent a proposal to NASA, 10 pages. A month later, we were approved. So we were going for the next flight now. I don't envy the young people now who they have to write many hundreds of pages. They wait for a year to get approved, you know, for their experiment. So we did it in a couple of weeks, you know, and, uh, and just 10 pages. The same spirit that the Keck Institute select proposal here at Caltech, because that's how you encourage innovation and, and uh, people coming with new idea and moving quickly about pushing the limit. Uh, you know, the, the boundary of our, our knowledge. So anyway, on the Sur B, uh, all of a sudden we got a bunch of archeologists who asked us, well, can you image this area in Oman? Uh, we know from historic document, there is a city called the city of Ubar, which was famous for frankincense. It was mentioned in the Bible. Uh, and that's where all the Magi, one of the Magi came with the frankincense uh, you know, uh, when, when Christ was born, at least what they had in the, in the Bible. So we took the images over that area and we did see very interesting features. So we conducted an expedition and you can see here a group of us, you know, on the top right, that's a group, you know, some of them from JPL, some of them from Oman, some people from England. Uh, top left is uh, me taking a picture with a group, you know, by then I lost my mustache, that was three years later. Uh, a group of uh, local people in that area. Uh, they were very hospitable. So you see at the bottom right, they were offering us coffee. And remember those were the days before GPS. So we had to really figure out ways how to navigate ourselves. So here we were pointing in different direction. We had that big uh, antenna that we had behind us. So it was a little bit more challenging than you would see today, but there was a big difference. Here we were the, the guest of uh, the Prince of Oman. So uh, we were put not, not in tents, but in really nice hotels that, uh, that uh, they offered to us in, in the area, not too far from there. So anyway, uh, making a long story short, we actually discovered uh, that actually there was a fort in that area where, uh, where Ubar, uh, you know, is most likely happened. And it was a fort which was around a water well. So as the caravan were traveling, they had to go to that fort and actually get, uh, get their water. And now that site, uh, then there was about a 20 years uh, exploration in that site. And now it's one of the main sites in tourism that uh, Oman uh, advertised. So if you go Google Ubar, you can see some of the more recent images about the tourism in that area. So we contributed both to the science as well as the tourism. Now then came a next, again, after the Serbi, 
uh, mission, the NASA said, okay, do you have any better ideas? We said, sure. You know, we can come up with a colored radar. And what we mean by color is actually to do a radar which have multiple frequencies or multiple wavelengths, the same way you'll, you see the different color, red, blue, and green, and yellow. So we, we proposed to do what we call sur C, which was flown in the late, uh, in the early 90s or the mid 90s. And that was really a huge step forward, you know, in, uh, in developing capability of observing the Earth. So I thought I'll show you a couple of examples and what those things are being used for. So first, you know, clearly it, it did the same thing as what we did on Sur A. We were able actually to penetrate below the surface. Again, that's in Egypt. So you can see on the top is a photograph that's in the visible and you can see the Nile, but nobody realized that in the old days, the Nile, the, the Nile had a different channel. And that's what you see on the radar image in the bottom, which then got diverted and then got covered by sand dunes. And the nice thing about Sur C is we had multiple frequency. We had three centimeters, we had five centimeters and 25 centimeters. Each one of them was capable to penetrate to a different depth. So we were able to kind of almost date when that, uh, that was taken because it penetrated you know, much farther below the surface. And this is another example that was taken over uh, in uh, Central Africa in uh, Rwanda, where now you see that each frequency we gave it a color and we can see different features with the different colors. That means we are seeing different features with the different wavelengths. And part of it, again, to give you the technical, aspect of it is the penetration through the vegetation. So you can see that the longer wavelengths penetrate down to the surface, while the shorter wavelength scatters from the top of the vegetation. So we were able to do different penetration below the surface. And also depending on the surface roughness, different wavelengths will scatter differently. So the flows that you see here is actually the, the lava flow from the volcano. And for the people who are interested, this is the area where the gorilla are living, you know, in, uh, in uh, Rwanda and in Central Africa. So many expeditions were taken there and we provided these images for the people organizing those expeditions. Another thing feature that we added on that radar is what we call polarization. So polarization is like your glasses, when you get polarized the glasses depending if you have vertical polarization or horizontal polarization, you get different signals from the surface. So here, what we did, when we say HH, that means we transmit with a horizontal polarization and receive horizontal, and we gave it the red color. The green is you transmit horizontal receiving vertical, we gave it the green color. And VV mean you transmit vertical and receive vertical, which gave it the blue color. And you can see that they interact very differently. This is in this valley, that they interact very differently with the surface. And to bring you to a more familiar place, this is the image taken over Los Angeles. And you can see at the top right, JPL. We always make sure JPL looks very bright in our radar images. Then you see the 210 freeway. Just below it, you can see Colorado Boulevard and you can see Caltech. Also, we, we uh, put Caltech as being a bright area. But what thing which is interesting is the different colors that you see in the polarization in different cities, Santa Monica, you know, or uh, the Dodger Stadium or, or the Pasadena area. And what it turned out is that when the streets in that city are lined up along the flight path of the shuttle, the signal comes, hits the, the street, hits the side of the wall, and then come back like a corner reflector. Like when you used to shine light, you know, reflecting light in somebody else's, you know, face, that's exactly what was happening here. So it allowed us to distinguish the different direction you know, of the street. Now we know them in Los Angeles, but we were doing that uh, worldwide. And then it had a wide spectrum of application. In this case, about vegetation and moisture. So it turned out different polarization reflect differently from the vegetation and the crops and the soil moisture. And the explanation is fairly simple. Crops tend to go vertical, you know, particularly the tree trunks and the trunks of the crops. So a vertical polarization tend to reflect very well from a vertical structure. While the leaves, they are all over the place, so they tend to reflect more in the depolarized or the HV polarization. So that allows us to develop techniques where actually we can separate the biomass 
which is in the leaves of the vegetation from the biomass, which is in the trunks of the vegetation. And then the same thing was applied, the same capability was applied in the polar ice, in this case in Antarctica, where we actually also can determine the age of the different ice flows based on the polarization as well as on the frequency. And uh, ultimately, now here we were doing a shuttle flight for only a few weeks, but ultimately the interest you know, with free flyer, which are being used now, is to be able to monitor the ice for shipping and for understanding the motion of the ice and understanding how much of the ice is being melting from one year to the next. And that's another example mapping forested area. This is in Moscow. Moscow itself is a, at the bottom left. You can see the circle there that the highway which goes around, around Moscow, but the focus really more is on determining the amount of vegetation cover, clear cutting, and how much biomass in that vegetation. And this technique is now being used in the Amazon to determine the changes in the biomass and the implication for global change. Then in the mid nineties, we came with a very dramatic step and that's what we call radar interferometry. So let me explain it a little bit. So many of you, if you have taken physics class, you, you remember Fresnel uh, fringes. So if you take, take a white sheet of paper, punch two little holes in it, and then you illuminate it, particularly if you illuminate it with a laser light or coherent light. On the other side, if you have a surface, you will see fringes you know, black and white or dark and light, light fringes. And then if you are putting those fringes on a surface which has topography, then the fringes will kind of get bent depending on the topography that you are illuminating. So inversely, if we see the fringes and see how they are displayed, we can determine the topography, you know, of that surface. So we proposed, you know, what we call SRTM for Shuttle Radar Topography Mission to NASA. And to do the interferometry, we had to deploy a very long boom, more than 100 feet, and put another antenna on the other side. And that was a great idea that Ed Caro and Mike Kobrick and Paul Rosen and a number of the people at that time who were all young, well, young graduate, particularly Paul, came up with that concept. And Howard Zepker, who is now visiting at Caltech, professor at Stanford, came up with that concept and how we can use it for doing topographic mapping. But you have to see the reaction at NASA when we went and told them, hey, we want to deploy a hundred feet boom out of the shuttle. Their first reaction, you guys must be smoking something. This is a high risk you know, to do that. What if that boom doesn't retract back in? How are we going to close the bay of the shuttle? But to their credit, the astronaut and the people at the Johnson Space Center worked with us and they said, okay, look, there is an easy solution. If we cannot roll it in, we just break it, cut it, and, and let it go away. So, so finally, there was an agreement to do that. And uh, we flew this mission. We did uh, you know, that flight in the early 2000. And that's the kind of example of we got from it. So this is actually the topography generated from the radar interferometry or SRTM. And we superimposed the Landsat image on it. And again, you see where JPL and Caltech are. But the interesting thing is up to that time for the last hundred years, the way people were generating contour map and topography is by taking stereo images and having literally hundreds and hundreds of people spending years looking through the stereo images and doing contours by hand. It was a very you know, tough process, time consuming, people consuming. And here in literally 12 days, we mapped the whole world all in digital format. And that's what you use today. So when you are actually seeing topographic images or, or a perspective, like when you see it on the weather report over Los Angeles in the morning, uh, these are all coming, the, the 3D images are coming from this mission. And then it was used extensively now uh, by pilots. So when you are flying in the middle of the night, particularly in mountainous areas, and you cannot see what's in front of you, you actually display, if you know from GPS your location and you have access to this data set, you actually can see what's in front of you. So it had a whole spectrum of benefit, not only for geologic purposes and for camping and hiking, uh, but also flights you know, during the night and for whole spectrum of application. All of that came out in 12 days and 
we basically put out of business all the people doing the stereo imaging. Uh, but that's how advances happen. You know, just a flash of an idea that uh, happened for with the team at JPL and working with NASA and the Johnson Space Center and the astronaut and the shuttle, basically we revolutionized how we actually do topographic mapping. Then came, you know, the brilliant people. Uh, I, I have to give them the credit, the people like Paul Rose and Howard Zepter, uh, Mark Simon, who is a faculty here at Caltech. Then they came with the idea, said, well, you know, if we take an image on one day and we come back the following day and a feature have moved by a few centimeters. And if we combine those two images coherently, that means we combine amplitude and phase, we actually should be able to see that. And actually we conducted experiment uh, using uh, international satellites as well as sat uh, airborne uh, instrument from JPL. And what you see at the bottom left, an image which was taken before an earthquake combined with an image taken after an earthquake. And these fringes represent the motion which happened as a result of that earthquake. And these fringes correspond to few centimeters of displacement. So just imagine from space, you can actually measure a few centimeters of displacement on the surface. And, the pen, and you see the same thing on the picture on the right over the coast of Chile. Now you'll say, well, what's the benefit of doing that because the earthquake happened? Well, if you do it fairly quickly, you can inform the rescuers about where are the most motion, which means most likely the, the most destruction which have happened. But also as we look at stress along fault, we might get indication of areas which could be high risk you know, of earthquake. And then we moved on to look at volcanoes, you know, which tend to inflate before an eruption happens. So we can see that, so we can predict the potential eruption. And then now it's being used commonly. This is taken from a system called ARIA, which uh, Caltech JPL have developed together. And it's showing basically the stress along different areas in, uh, in the Andes by looking at the displacement from earthquake or the stress happening you know, on a regular basis along uh, during. Uh, and then came this one, which is in my mind, one of the most dramatic application. So this was images taken of Los Angeles over a period of about six years. And you see Los Angeles actually breathing or the, the Los Angeles basin. And the reason it's breathing like this is because in areas where you are pumping water out, the surface kind of subsides a little bit. And then where water is coming in to fill the aquifer, it's moving back up. And again, look at the top, this is centimeters that we are talking about. So this led to now the application of being able to monitor what's the status of the aquifers in areas like the Central Valley. So during the summer, when the water is being pumped out, we see actually subsidence. During the winter, as uh, Sierra, the uh, so snow melts in the Sierra, we actually, it fills and moves back up. And that's now is being used by the state of California to manage the water table and the water pumping because on the average, it's going down. And so, so this technology, uh, you know, actually is now being used and I'll come back to it in a little bit. But in the meantime, as we were doing all these shuttle uh, radar, the first project I worked on at JPL in, 19, in 1969 or 1970 was to plan a mission for Venus. Well, that mission took 20 years for it to happen. It happened in the late 80s, but a lot of this radar capability and technology and knowledge that we did from the shuttle was then applied for mapping Venus. And the same thing, we applied the same techniques to map uh, Titan, which is completely haze covered. Uh, it was part of the Cassini mission. And we discovered that there are lakes you know, on Titan and that was one of the major discovery from that mission using also a radar, a radar system. But the most dramatic one is going to happen two years from now. And that's a mission called NISAR for NASA ESA Synthetic Aperture Radar. So this is going to be a free flyer, which is built at JPL. Matter of fact, you know, once the pandemic goes away and hopefully you'll be able to visit JPL, you'll actually see that in the high bay being assembled and Paul Rosen uh, the young person who worked on interferometry many years ago, he and Howard Depker and Mark Simon are now the key leaders of this mission. But what's unique about this mission, it will allow us to map the whole world every other week. 
and that being done worldwide. So we'll be able to see the changes in the surface due to the water changes, uh, water table changes. We'll be able to see the melting of the snow in the glacier, the motion of the glacier. So a whole, and the vegetation, how it's changed. So the whole world would be mapped literally every two weeks. And some area will be mapped more often, particularly closer to the, to the polar region. So this is going to be a revolution, which is basically the accumulation of all the capability and technology that we developed in Sir A, Sir B, Sir C, and SRTM. So now the older, the young people who developed that, uh, you know, 40 years ago, now they are somewhat older or what, like my daughter say, wiser. So now we'll be watching the next generation of people actually using using that data. And now I want to mention a little bit, you see, how do we generate that image at this high resolution? Because we are talking of resolution in the range of meters, you know, actual images of meters and motion of centimeter. It's a technique which we call synthetic aperture radar. And basically, instead of sending one pulse and you get an echo back and you generate the image, an image, you send a series of pulses as you are flying and then you get the data back and you record it. And then you combine them coherently. So the aperture looks like it's much longer than the aperture, the physical aperture. And that's why we call it synthetic aperture. It's a combination of using the phase or using the Doppler shift to allow us to generate better images. And that's a little bit the characteristic of that system. As I mentioned earlier, it will be at two frequencies that we will use what we call L-band and S-band. So that's 25 centimeter and about 10 centimeter will be imaging worldwide at resolution of about 10 to 20 meters. And the most challenging thing in addition to acquiring the data is how do you analyze it? We are going to be getting literally 10 terabytes of data every day, continuous every week, every month, every year. And the question is, how do you analyze all that data? So people are working on a series of techniques of artificial intelligence, feature recognition. So actually we can extract the most valuable data or, or the scientific data that we're looking for. So there is a whole spectrum beyond, you know, the radar itself is also intelligence to actually extract information from that data. And these are the example, like I mentioned earlier, which the system is going to be doing and allow us to understand earthquake dynamics, inundation, uh, uh, you know, glaciers, and even for uh, looking at the damages which are happening because in this case, human damage, this is picture taken over Beirut just before and just after the explosion which happened a year and a few months ago. And that allowed basically the team on ARIA here at JPL and Caltech to show the area which were damaged extensively and within a day, that data was in the hand of the rescuer back in Lebanon. And as a result of all of this, now there is a whole plethora of orbiting satellites using, uh, using radar. So you see people, uh, the ERS are done by the European uh, radar set, are done by the Canadian, uh, ELOS is done by the Japanese, and a whole, and uh, Cosmos SkyMed done by the Italian and the, and the Argentinian. And now the whole, there is a whole slew of commercial companies which are developing these satellites and flying them. And every time we go to meetings where they describe what they are doing, they always point out uh, to the series of Sir A, Sir B, Sir C, S, R, T, M, which really laid out the foundation you know, of uh, all these systems that are flying now. And uh, as you can see, NISAR would be, would be the US satellite, which will be launched in two years. And I guess I got a reward out of all of this because I was the head of that team and then being the director of JPL. So NASA and JPL and Caltech named the mission operation after me. I wanted them to put all the names of the people who worked on Sir A who started this. They said, well, that's a little bit long. So we'll give you the credit and you can pass that credit to the rest of the team. And I always end my, my uh, talks with this one because really that represents the spirit of Caltech, JPL, and NASA, and the Keck Institute is, we are here to dare mighty things. This is a quote I stole from uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and, and the, the rest of the quote is, it's far better to dare mighty things, even though checkered with failure, than to live in the twilight, which knows neither victory nor defeat. 
So that's my message for all the people who are listening. We should be daring mighty things. That's what the United States is about. That's what Caltech is about. That's what JPL and NASA are about. Even if things we get setbacks, but that's how you move the frontier of knowledge. Thank you again. And I want to thank the Keck Institute for having me speaking tonight. Thank you so much uh, for your time, uh, Dr. Lachi. Uh, we have a bunch of questions lined up. Um, it looks like about 20 minutes to get through them. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so the first question is, uh, could you elaborate on why you mounted the antenna on a moving platform for the uh, second project, Serbi, uh, in Ubar? Yeah, basically what we did on that mission, we took the Sir A antenna. Now, this was a big antenna, which weighed many tons. Mm -hmm. And then we put it on motor on a platform, which was behind it. And actually that allowed us to move, if I recall, from somewhere around 10, 12 degrees all the way to 45 degrees. So that allowed us during Sir B to do what we call stereo radar imaging. But equally important, it was to see the reflection and uh, the, that we are getting from the surface at different angles. And that allowed us to be able to characterize the surface better than just when we were imaging at one single angle. Sure. sure. Um, so uh, the next question is, uh, why did different types of lava flow and volcanic rock have different color in the Sir C images? Uh, yeah, so as I, yeah, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, the reflection from the radar is dependent on the surface roughness. Mm -hmm. So if you have been to a volcanic field, you can see that there is a whole variety of roughness, what's, what's called uh -uh and pahoe, pahoe, you know, uh, lava flows. So you see some of them which are very, very rough and some of them which are somewhat smooth. So by looking at different frequencies, then we get different reflection, you know, from the roughness of the surface. For, uh, for instance, very short wavelengths will reflect a lot from the rough surfaces, but not as much from the smooth surfaces. So then we take those three images at three different frequencies, and we gave each one a different color. So similar to what our eyes you know, are sensitive. And that's why you see that color. So, so you have to be thinking in a radar mind in a sense, not, not your eyes uh, about you know, the colors that you are seeing. So in addition to the like surface roughness and properties, can you um, learn something about the composition of those rocks from uh, these images? Yeah, now we get a little bit. So it's not like imaging spectroscopy where you can get spectral signatures. What we can get here uh, is we are measuring the roughness and the electri electric properties of the surface because that's what the microwave is sensitive to. So we can separate different rocks which have different electric properties and then for a vegetation area, there we get a lot of uh, separation between the vegetation and you, in your usual eyes, they are most of the vegetation is green. So it's harder to kind of separate. But in the radar, depending on the size of the leaves, the direction of the branches and so on, we get different scattering. So we can actually separate. And then the other one, to go back to your earlier question, uh, the soil moisture in the ground. So as you have more moisture, you have different conductivity and we can determine and extract the moisture, which is in the ground, which is of great importance for the farmers. So we'll be able to tell them which fields are dry and which fields are wet and therefore they can irrigate them. So that's the kind of experiment that, uh, or the kind of information that we'll be able to get. Um, so our next question um, sort of related, uh, does the shift of the soil uh, when water is being pumped out of the ground uh, does that correspond to soil types uh, exhibiting liquefaction during earthquakes? Well, it's basically what we are seeing is the displacement mm -hmm. or, or the motion. So an earthquake actually does create displacement, which happens. That's why you feel it so well. So basically every element on the surface which have moved uh, about a centimeter or more, we actually see it uh, in those fringes. So it's actually a picture and the fringes correspond to the displacement that you are seeing on the surface. So uh, as long as I'm at Caltech and I do an advertising, anybody at Caltech who's interested in this, you can go to Howard Zepker, who's visiting Caltech in the geology department, giving a course specifically on radar interferometry. And later in the year, during the second and third semester, Paul DeRozan will be giving the course on uh, introduction to physics of remote sensing. So if you are fascinated by this, 
you can come to, to their class if you are at Caltech. If you are from outside Caltech, you still probably can sit down and audit that class. Um, so our next question, uh, could you uh, please expand on the data volume required, uh, the communication systems and bandwidth um, for these types of missions? Yeah, and as, how has this evolved in the last 40 years? Well, uh, really, the, the evolution has been dramatic. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, we didn't even have a digital link, you know, on the first shuttle flight. So we had to put all the data on, a, uh, on an optical recorder until we brought down. But then as we moved into Sir B and Sir C, then the shuttle had a more advanced digital link that they used to communicate via TDRS, which is a satellite, you know, in a geostationary. So that's how we started getting our data in on SRTM. Now on uh, NISAR, where we are literally talking of terabits, uh, basically the data will be recorded on board that reflect on the evolution of uh, the chips that now you, how much data you can put on them. Mm -hmm. And when it comes over a couple of stations around the world, the data is being dumped down. So I think there are stations up close to the North Pole and station uh, you know, in the South Pole or in South America. And you'll be able to come over them multiple times per day. So the data is being dumped down and then transmitted like any, any link that we have today. The challenge is the transmission is already a challenge, but the bigger challenge is then processing all that data, which is being done in the clouds and then being able to analyze it and extract information from it. I mean, it's not possible for you know, humans sit down and look at 10 terabytes of data every day. So, I mean, we'll look at some of it. So you need some kind of autonomous tools, computing capability to be able to extract. Of course, you have to program it to tell us what you are looking for uh, to be able to extract that uh, information that you want. And we want to be able to do it in a way that not only scientists and radar experts can use the system, but the average public, I mean, the ultimate, what we want to do is to be able, almost anybody who's listening today can get a program on their iPhone or get an app on their iPhone and it can follow the NISAR data and get whatever information they want to get from it. That'll be really cool when that uh, happens. Um, uh, so another question. So I think on your slides, uh, the breathing of LA, right? We saw it to 2002. Um, does that become more dramatic in recent years uh, because of drought or just other factors? Uh, I have not seen, I have not looked at images at different times. Uh, you know, uh, before the drought or after the drought. But I wouldn't be surprised that uh, you'll be able to see the difference because the vegetation would be different, you know, from having leaves to being dry vegetation. The soil is different, uh, you know, because you don't have as much moisture in it. Uh, I have not seen it, but I think that's a pretty nice application. I wouldn't be surprised that somebody is working on that topic. Yeah, um, yeah we'll have to go digging, I guess. Um, so uh, next question, how were the changes in polarity uh, due to street surfaces determined? And were there uh, ground-based or lab experiments that you supplemented uh, your radar findings with? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we do experiment at a number of experiments. Like for instance, we put corner reflectors on the ground mm -hmm. so we can get calibration. Because one of the key things we want to do when you get a radar image and you have the brightness of it at different polarization, uh, what does that mean? Uh, again, for the technical guy, what's a cross section? You know, which is in a sense the reflectivity if you want in the radar domain. So we put corner reflectors on the ground and we use that for calibrating, you know, the radar signal. Uh, also, we have usually fields where we use radars on booms and actually measure the reflection and then compare that to what we are seeing on the satellite mm -hmm. radar images. So there are whole groups of people who are really working on how do you calibrate and quantify these things. And that lead to developing algorithm, like for instance, on the moisture, is to develop algorithm which relate to radar backscatter or cross section, if you want, uh, with the soil moisture amount and do it both in vegetated area and bare areas. So there is now a whole library. I mean, in the old days in during survey, we had very little of that, but now there is a whole library and and teams all around the world who are working on doing this kind of calibration. Um, uh, our next question is, uh, could you use a large number of microsats or picosats or other small satellite um, to help improve imaging resolution? 
That's, that's a good, a very good question. Uh, it's not necessarily for improving the resolution, but it will allow us to actually focus on certain areas. So now, uh, I mean, there is the concept some people could do if you put a number of small radar on a, uh, on a series, one after the next, you can basically build a aperture, you know, a bigger aperture, like you do some of the probably listener are familiar with uh, antennas on the ground where you combine the data from them. But uh, the commercial thing, I think that's kind of a big advance which happened in the last few years with uh, light, up, uh, light material, uh, integrated electronics. Now you can build these radars, you know, kind of somewhat lighter, but they will be still limited by the amount of power that they have, you know, solar power and amount of power that you can put. So the small commercial satellite tend to focus for if you're interested in localized area. Like the military, they are interested in a number of areas which they can tell you ahead of time, you know, what are those areas. So you focus on those and can get down to about fraction of a meter resolution. Or if you are looking at shipping, you know, where the ships are moving, like what's happening now in the Los Angeles Harbor or, or Long Beach Harbor. So you can track those ships and monitor them. On the science side, what NISAR is doing, we want global coverage all the time because we are trying to understand the impact on the whole climate. So in that case, you need this much more sophisticated radar, which tend to be bigger, but the two can complement each other. So you could imagine where you are doing global coverage every week. And if there is something interesting happening in some area, an earthquake or volcanic, then you can ask the commercial to kind of get data focused over those areas. So the two are going to be complementary. Um. So our next question is, uh, can you discuss the future of radar versus LIDAR? Uh, do you think LIDAR will replace uh, radar in certain cases? No, they, they are really very different uh, purpose. And uh, let me give you one simple case. You cannot operate the LIDAR when it's cloudy. You know, while the radar, because we are using microwave, we can penetrate through the cloud. Also, the challenge is on uh, in the LIDAR is in the radar, we can map very large area. So the LIDAR would, would be perfect or it is perfect for measuring topography like under the satellite or kind of scan it a little bit so you can build a 3D image. Uh, people are using it like to look at tree heights. So part of the light from the laser penetrate to the surface and part get reflected from, uh, from the trees. And, and they give you different kind of information. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the technique of doing interferometry and looking at surface motion I think the radar is much more appropriate to do that than the LIDAR. Somebody, some brilliant Caltech student might inv invent a way to do it with LIDAR, but as of now, it's really only capability done with radar instruments. Right. Um, so our next question, uh, what do you think will happen after uh, NISAR and VENSAR? Uh, as a leader in the field, where do you um, see uh, the future of JPL going with this? Future of JPL or future of radar? <laughs> I think both. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me talk a little bit about the radar. Already Paul Rosen and a team working with him and I'm working with them as the wise old man are looking at the follow-up you know, mission. And it was a mission uh, or, or uh, capability which was uh, recommended by the National Academy, what we call the CADAL survey. People, uh, the same people I mentioned earlier, like uh, Howard Zepker and... Uh, and Mark Simon are also involved in it, is to see what do we do after NISAR? Uh, because we are interested both in capability of monitoring change, but also long-term change. You know, what happens not only to take data over one year or two year or three year, but we want to take decades and see the changes happening. Now, wearing my hat of the ex-JPL uh, director, I think JPL is, is a great institution. I, I never worry about it. Uh, not because of the leadership, even though the leadership helps a little bit, but really the talent that we have at JPL, the 7,000 explorers that we have at JPL. It's an amazing set of talent. And, uh, and I'm very, very always optimistic about the future and particularly this their mighty things. Now you see it everywhere at JPL. And that's exactly what people at JPL do. One perfect example recently is the helicopter on Mars. Mm -hmm. The first time ever we fly a, uh, a helicopter or an airplane, if you want, on another planet. So this was doing what the Wright brothers did 114 years ago. 
So that's the kind of spirit of JPL. And I'm sure there will be all kinds of new, exciting breakthrough things like what we did on the helicopter or bringing sample return or in Earth observation, seeing what's happening in our climate. Yeah, I think we'll, I agree, we'll just see that innovation keep, keep going forward. Um, so uh, another question, uh, you spoke about using radar to map and observe agricultural sites uh, and farming. Um, do you think it can be used to detect the health of crops before harvesting? Or uh, Mike, you interrupted a little bit. Were you talking about imaging crops? Uh, right, so um, for using radar to map and observe agricultural sites and farming. Oh, okay, yeah. about agricultural sites. Yeah, no, I think, uh, and, and the application are multiple. One application clearly is looking at different vegetation and the health of the vegetation. Because I mean, if you go in a field and you can see if it's healthy or not healthy, there is a different, you know, kind of, uh, if you want uh, the, the structure of the vegetation is somewhat different and we can sense that. The moisture on the surface, we can sense that. The thickness of the vegetation, we can sense that by multiple frequency instruments. So one of the uh, key applications that people are working on and is the amount of biomass which are in the forest because that has a direct relationship to amount of the carbon dioxide exchange with the atmosphere. So even that we are not seeing the atmosphere or the carbon dioxide, we are seeing the proxies which can impact, you know, basically on, on a global basis. Um, so uh, we're nearing the end of the hour. So I think we have our most technical question of the night coming up. Um, and that is what possessed you to shave off your mustache? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess my wife, told me I need to look a little bit more distinguished. So she made me shave my mustache. <laughs> but I should say people with mustache are very distinguished, you know, too. I think it must have been, you know, kind of it. Uh... <laughs> I know my wife is watching, so she's probably having a laugh. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to hear back from her what she thought. Um, so that's the end of our Q&A uh, uh, session. Um, you know, we really appreciate you taking the time to put together this talk and um, spending answering all these questions with us. Um, so we sent you a, a small gift, which I believe you have. Um, so <laughs> would you mind opening that and sharing it with everyone? Wow, it looks like Santa just landed here. I have to pick it up, so could I open it? Yes, please. Wow, look at that. <laughs> you know, shuttle imaging radar, so I have a bunch of them, man. Okay, Valerie, that's what we'll use for cocktails from now on. We'll put them under our cocktails when we have our cocktail hour. Thank you. Oh, the, each one of them is different too. Mm -hmm. So you have the different... Thank you very much, Santa. And thank you, the Keck Institute. And I want, before I finish, to thank all the people who worked with me on Sir A, Sir B, Sir C, at JPL. So it's really thousands of people who get a lot of the credit for what actually has been accomplished. So thank you all if you are listening to this. Yeah, th thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Alachi. Um, I just wanna let everybody know, we have uh, another lecture coming up on Tuesday, December 7th at 5 p.m. Uh, that's with uh, Dr. Nicole Lewis. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Lachi, uh, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you, take care everybody. <laughs>